The title of the sermon today is Blessed for Believing Without Seeing. And today we're going to talk about Thomas and we're going to look at how God works with people, uh, with anybody that he's calling and he transforms lives. So we're going to look at that today. The scripture reading is going to be from John 20 verses 19 to 31 from the ESV. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger inside the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are the true and living words of God. Thank Thank you, Jesus, for being the resurrection and the truth. Amen. Amen. Recently, I was reading in a book called uh, by Josh McDowell, and uh, the title of the book is The Evidence That Demands a a Verdict. Um, It's in two volumes, and answer to questions challenging Christian in the 21st century. And in sharing the story of his conversion, I would like, as I retell in the story uh, of Josh McDowell, I would encourage you to think about and see the hand of God behind his conversion because he is the one who changes hearts and the, his story has similarities with uh, the Apostle Thomas it's not exactly the same of course because Thomas was an apostle and Josh McDowell is not but I, so basically he, Josh McDowell is a very intelligent and brilliant man. He has wrote, written many books. But very early on, God was already working in his life. And we see the invisible hands of God as he retells his story. And as a teenager, uh, he had a very important question in his life. And he was seeking answers for these. Who am I? Was one of his questions. The other question was, why am I here? And where I am, where am I going? Those are all important questions as a teenager that, you know, had he had that in his mind. Now, we realize that a lot of people don't even think about those things, but he did. Because God was all was stimulating his mind, I believe. And so, as a young student, he looks for an, he looked for answers, and he was like a 
a dog not letting go letting go of the bone I suppose just just very focused and so as he grew up where he lived it everyone seemed to be in religion so he thought he would able he would be able to find the answer to these question of who he was where he was going and his purpose in life in religion so he began to go to church and he said he got into it 150 percent he went to church in the morning in the afternoon in the evening and he says that when he went to church he felt worse inside after having gone to church he felt worse in the church than he felt outside the church and he was brought up as, as a in a farming community in Michigan in the US and farmers as you know are very practical people down to earth kind of people we know that because we have a farmer in our midst so very down to earth very practical but anyway his father had told him that if something did not work, that he was to chuck it aside. So he chucked religion aside, because there was no answer in religion. He did not find, as he did not find answers in religion, he thought he would find answers in his, for his quest for happiness and meaning in education. So he enrolled after his graduation, he enrolled in university and there he was greatly disappointed, as he said, you know, you can learn a lot of things at, in university, but you cannot find the purpose of life. You cannot find the reality of who we are, where we're going, what's going to happen to us. It was not there. And he questioned the professors to a point where he made a nuisance of himself. When they saw him coming, sometimes they would shut the door and or put out the blinds to see as if they were not there, I guess, in, in where he was attending university. And he realized that other students had many problems, many frustrations. They had a, a lot of unanswered questions about life as well. And he said one time that he was walking around the university campus where he saw a student with a sign on, on his back. And the sign on his back said, do not follow me, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess that reflected a lot of people not really knowing why we're here, why we're, why we're on this earth. So he realized that he would not find the, his answer in religion. He would not find his answers, the answers to his question in higher education. So he tried another av avenue. A and again, he's a still alive and and as he was growing up he still had these qualities he was a very intelligent warm brilliant person so he thought you know I'm going to try to obtain answers to life through prestige and he realized that on campus the people that had the most influence were the people who had who were in the in the student council because they could manage money they would be known by everyone and uh, so he got elected. And he got to know a whole lot of students, and he was known by a whole lot of students. And as he says, he became part of the elite who controlled some of the university money. And he also found out that this was an empty pursuit. That did not satisfy. So feeling empty, he began to look for the weekend to have pleasure have fun, to have, to ease his questions. And so his happiness would resolve around Friday and Saturday and Sunday. But every morning, every Monday morning, he would wake up with a headache because of his behavior on the weekend. So he continued to feel pretty empty and he could find nothing that would satisfy his hunger for the questions he was asking. And then one day he noticed a small group of stu uh, a small group on campus. There were eight students and and two faculty. 
And he noticed that there was something very different about these, these people. To Josh, they appeared to be to know where they were going and what was the purpose of life. And there was a quality of them that he about them that he admired because they were convict they had conviction. And they were, you know, convicted people are not easily swayed. So he, he generally liked people with conviction because you can have great discussions and very stimulating time with them. So he wanted to know more about them. And there was another quality about them that he greatly admired. And that's and that was love. They not only loved one another, but they cared and loved other people outside the group. And so he he had a discussion with them. And in their discussion at one of their meetings, because he befriended them, uh, he was a he was a friendly guy. And so he the subject of God came up. And this made him very uncomfortable. And he put up a big front not to show how uneasy he was. And so he answered, as they had this discussion, he basically told them that Christianity was for weaklings and not for intellectuals. But deep down, he wished that he had what they had, which he didn't have. But his pride got in the way, and he did not want to admit that he really admired these people and he really wanted what they had. So during the conversation, during one of the conversations, he turned to one of the girls of the group and said, and he asked point blank, he said, tell me what changed your life. Why are you so different from other students and faculty? And the girl looked at him squarely in the eye and gave him an answer he would never expect. She answered, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ changed my life. And Josh quickly responded to her by telling her not to give that, her, him that kind of garbage. He told her squarely that he was fed up with religion, with the Bible, and with church. And the, the girl quickly responded, Mr., I don't say religion, I say Jesus Christ. And he was surprised by the girl's courage and conviction. And he apologized for his attitude. And he said to her, But I'm sick and tired of religion and religious people. I don't want to, to have anything to do with it. And Josh, uh, while he was at university, was a, a pre-law student. And say his friends gave him a challenge says, why don't you intellectually prove whether Jesus exists or not? And he basically thought that it was a waste of time because intellectually Christianity would not have a leg to stand on. Because he, he was cynical, he was unbelieving, and he had grave doubts. So day after day, I guess, as he, they, he continued to befriend them, these people continued to give him a challenge. And he became so irritated and so frustrated with their insistence that he decided, I'm going to take up the challenge. And his purpose was to prove that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, and he was going to try to refute that Christianity was had a, had a foundation. He was going to prove that it was without a foundation. So one day, he was sitting in the library in London, England, and he sensed a, a voice within, within himself saying, Josh, you don't have a leg to stand on. And he quickly dismissed that thought. Because sometimes we do that, we get a thought that is that goes against our thinking, and the automatic reaction is to say, "Well, I just don't want to think about that." You know, that's 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 not that's kind of stupid. It's just I don't know where it comes from. But however, the more he studied, the more this thought 
kept popping up in his mind that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And he was accumulating evidence. He said that he returned to the United States and he could not sleep at night. From about 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning, he would wake up trying to refute the overwhelming evidence that he was accumulating that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. And as he, in his head, he knew, but he also began to the realization that he was intellectually dishonest. You know, when your mind tells you something and you're convinced and you don't want to go, we don't want to go along because we want to refute that, that's where he was. He was, and he realized that. He admitted that he was intellectually dishonest at one point. Because he knew that he was finding the truth about Jesus, but in his will he resisted, and he did not want to submit to, to Jesus, to God. And there's a, a scripture that he found in Revelation 3.20 that began to reverberate in his mind that he could not really get away from, you know, how the Holy Spirit works at times, well, many times in our minds. In Revelation 3.20 it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So God, Jesus, does not force himself in anybody. He knocks and we have, the, we have to let him in. That's, that's our participation. And for, in his mind, because of the life that he was living, he thought there is no faster way of ruining my life and the fun I have other, by becoming a Christian. That is, the, that is the fastest way of ruining my good time, he thought, and the fun I have. So he had a, a ma an inner major conflict, and he needed to resolve it. He said this, this inner driving that he f knew it was true, but he didn't want to submit to it, just drove him crazy. So one night, while he, he was in Michigan, he decided to put Christ's claim to the supreme test. And one evening in his home, at the end of the second year of, of university, he became a Christian. And he said four things to Jesus Christ. He said, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. And Josh McDowell, in his research, realized that he was deeply loved by God. This is what brought him to Jesus, that Jesus would love him, loved him enough to die for him. And then the second thing he told Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. And as he says, I, he, I didn't have a, any problem admitting that I was a sinner because of my lifestyle. I knew it was not in line with the grace of God. And he also understood from the Bible that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We read that in 1 John 1, verse 9. And he believed this scripture. He believed that he was forgiven. And he prayed. He said to Jesus, Right now, in the best way I know how, I open the door of my life and place my trust in you as Savior and Lord. Take over the control of my life. Change me from the inside out. Make me the type of person you created me to be. And then he said to Jesus, thank you for coming into my life. And after he prayed that prayer and he had that conversation with Jesus, he said nothing happened. In fact, he, he felt worse, if anything. He was afraid that he had made a decision based on emotions, a decision that he would later regret. And he began to fear what his friends would say when he would tell them that he gave his life to Jesus Christ. He basically thought, what have I done? 
what have I done? He just felt that he had gone off the deep end, if you will. But in the few years that happened, in, in the one and a half years that followed, he said that his entire life changed. His perception of life and his view of people just changed. The ultimate goal that he had was, was to become a governor of, of Michigan. And his attitude towards people was, you know, you use people to get where you want. And so he wanted to reach the plateau of political success, I guess, in Michigan. And after he gave his life and surrendered his life in the hands of Jesus, his perception of people began to change. Instead of wanting people to serve him and use people, he began to have the, the attitude of wanting to serve people. He became other-centered rather than self-centered. There was a complete change in his orientation of life. And he also had a bad temper. He would go into a fly into a ridge at, just as a, somebody looked sideways at him and he didn't like it. In fact, the first year of university, he almost killed a man. And there's an incident that happened that would, really would have ticked him off in the, in, before, and he just didn't react. He realized that something was happening. And he, was, he had such an angry attitude before that he would not even question that it was a problem. He, it was just part of him. And all of a sudden, this change that surprised him. Now, he almost, he, he had a, one of the most significant problems that he had and that carried with him was hatred and bitterness. And the person he hated the most was his father. His father was heavily addicted to alcohol. In the small place where he lived, he was known as the town drunk. When he would go to school, the other students would laugh at his father. And he would, Josh would go along with them, but inside he felt a lot of pain and he basically, I guess, desired that he would have a father that was responsible and loving. But he just went along and and when he was about eight years old, when he was eight years old, he he recounts that he would he would he would lie in bed and he would figure out a way to kill his father without being caught because of his father's drinking and and so his father was very violent towards his mother and I guess that's the source of his hatred and his bitterness this is what he writes I would sometimes find my mother in the barn lying in the manure behind the cows where my dad had beaten her with a hose until she could not get up my hatred seeded and I vowed to myself when I'm going to, when I'm going, when I am strong enough, I'm going to kill him. And the, the situation was so bad with his father that he was so heavily addicted to alcohol that when people would come to visit their home, that he would tie his father behind the barn or behind the building, would tie him behind his, his hand, and then as he would tie, his father being drunk, he would also put a, he would loop the rope around his neck so that his, if his father tried to get away, he was hoping that he would strangle himself. So that's the drive, that, that, the hatred that he had towards his father. And two months after his high school graduation, he walked into his house and he had a date. And he arrived home and his mother was sobbing so Josh ran to her and she sat in the bed and she said, son, your father has broken my heart, she said to Josh. She basically told him that she had promised herself that she wanted to see him graduate. And that after her, his graduation, she had no purpose to live anymore. And after he, he graduated, This happened two months after his mother told him that, and two months, 
when he graduated, the, the next Friday, his mother died of what he believes is a broken heart because she had lost the will to live because of the brutality of her husband. And you can see how that would fuel the anger and the hatred of a young man who loved his mother. So his hatred of his father just intensified. But as he made the decision to accept Jesus and to trust him as Savior and Lord, he said that the love of God inundated his heart. And God took his hatred of his father and turned it upside down. As God does that. Five months after becoming a Christian, he found himself with his father and he looked his father straight in the eye and he said, Dad, I love you. And Josh said that he did not really want to love his father, but his heart had been changed and he loved his father. So he went on to university and as he went on to university, he had a serious car accident. He was the victim of a drunk driver. So he went back to, to home to recover and his father came to see him. And that day his father was sober. And his father was very uneasy. He paced the floor in his room back and forth. And his father then blurted out, How can you love a father like me? And Josh told his father, Six months ago, I hated you. He despised him. And he had told his, his father that he had put his trust in Jesus Christ and that he had received forgiveness from God and that Jesus had changed his life. He told his father, you know, I can't explain it all, but I know what God has done for me. And he replaced the hatred with his, towards his dad with love. They talked for about an hour. Then his father said, Son, if God can do that, can do in my life what I saw him doing in yours, I want to give him an opportunity. Then he prayed, God, if you're really God and Jesus died on the cross to forgive me and what I've done to my family, I need you. If Jesus can do in my life what I seem him do in the life of my son I want to trust him as Savior and Lord and Josh says you know hearing that prayer was one of the greatest joy in my life and as Josh trusted God he saw this change in his life occur over a period of 6 to 18 months It didn't happen quickly like all, many of us. Change is slow, it doesn't come quickly. But for his father, there was an immediate change. He completely stopped drinking after 40, 40, year, 40 years of abusing alcohol, abusing his family. Fourteen months later after his father said this prayer, he died of complication from alcoholism because God does not take the physical consequences away. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, but he changed this man's heart. In that 14-month period, because he was a well-known guy in this small community, the changes were so dramatic that about 100 people committed their lives to Jesus Christ. They accepted Christ in their lives because they saw the incredible changes in the town's drunk, he said. And the town drunk was his father. You know, Jesus is in the business of changing lives from the inside out through the Holy Spirit. 
And God doesn't stop because a person has doubts, because a person is struggling. That doesn't stop God. So let's go back to Thomas. One thing that we can say about the Apostle Thomas is that even if he had doubts, he was willing to be proven wrong. And the Gospel refers to Thomas in only two places. Other places in John 11.16 and John 14.5. In John 11.16, it's, it's when Lazarus was resurrected to physical life. And Thomas had said to his fellow disciples that he was going to, with Jesus, and he was confident in, in his statement that he was willing to give his life as well. And the other incidence is when Jesus told his disciples that when that they were that they were not to be troubled, that they were to believe in God and to believe in Jesus. And Jesus was standing be- before them and he said to them, He said, You know, I'm going to the Father's house where there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Jesus told the disciples, You know the way. And of course, Thomas did not know the way. So he plainly told Jesus, you know, I don't know, it. I don't know the way. How can we know the way? And Jesus told the disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. And as we look at Jesus, at Thomas, he was obviously a, an honest man. He was... He was not afraid to voice his preoccupation and what he thought. But after the the resurrection, he had severe doubts. And for some reason, the Bible does not explain, Jesus appeared to ten of the disciples and Thomas was not there the first time. And Jesus said to his disciples twice, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. The disciples were afraid. They were afraid that they would be taken by the Jews and the same faith as happened to Jesus would happen to them. So Jesus gave them a job description. He said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And he told them that they would not be left alone and He breathed on them, and he told them to receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know that they received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So the the second time that Jesus appeared, Thomas was there. But Thomas had said first, what we read in the scripture reading, that unless he put his fingers in the nail hole and put his hand on the side where Jesus was pierced that he would not believe because really from a human point of view no one survived a Roman crucifixion and Jesus was a man he was walking with them he was 30 years old and they, 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 they had spent three and a half years with them and they saw him as a man and no one had ever survived this brutal and shameful and horrible death on the cross and it's interesting that when Jesus appeared the second time he, the doors were locked and Jesus appears and he told him peace be with you and he repeated to Thomas the words that Thomas had told the disciples and it doesn't tell us whether Thomas put his fingers in the nail hole or put his hand on the side. The Bible doesn't say. But really that's secondary. What is more important is what Thomas said. He said, My Lord and my God. See, worship Jesus. But we don't read in in those scriptures that Jesus ever condemned Thomas for not believing. 
he worked with him. And Thomas realized that Jesus was really the way, the truth, and the resurrection. That he had come in the flesh. Sent forth by the Father to invade a hostile kingdom, if you will. And that he was truly God in the flesh. That he was the one who would save everyone who would believe on him. And Jesus extended a blessing to those who have not seen but yet believe. And to believe Jesus and to believe in Jesus is a, is a, is a faith, is a belief that is be, the blessing is beyond what our puny human minds can understand, but we understand enough that the future in Christ, the future in God is absolutely fantastic. And I, words to describe it just escapes us. And like Josh McDowell, we realize that apart from Jesus, we cannot really, we cannot know who we really are. We cannot know our purpose on the earth. We cannot know our destination. But in Jesus, we have all those answers that we cannot find anywhere else. Because Jesus died as a condemned sinner in our place. He had no sin and he was victorious over death for all of us. So Jesus is the only one who satisfies all of our longings. And as we read the story of Josh McDowell, we see that God is not calling everyone. You know, God was obviously working with eight people. And God used those people to to touch Josh McDowell's life. But he did not call the whole university. When Jesus walked the earth, he called he called 12 men, 12 apostles. He did not call 24 or 48 or 100. He called 12. After his resurrection, a good number of people were converted, but not everybody was converted. Because God, at this time, calls people for his purposes to participate with him and it's really by grace that God does this and Jesus changed the disciples lives he changed my life and yours and God has given us a responsibility like he gave to the apostles to go out and to make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit and Josh McDowell expresses it well in his introduction he says Christianity is not something to be shoved down your throat or forced on you you have your life to live and I have mine all I can do is tell you what I have learned and experienced after that what you do with Christ is your decision. And we know that they are in God's good hands. They are included in Christ, other people. And God works with them as he wills. On a sign point, again, Jesus never berated Thomas for not believing without seeing. He worked with Thomas and he brought him to the point of faith. He brought us to a point of faith in a way that is very individual to each and every one of us. And while we can say what a great God we serve, what an incredible God we serve. Blessed are we, blessed are all who believe in Jesus without seeing him. That addresses all of us who, come, who have come to believe in Christ, accepted his death on the cross and his resurrection for us after the fact of the resurrection. We are a blessed people to believe without having, been, without having seen. Let us pray.